Okay, uh, obviously I stated that I was new to Watertech. I'm only three months new. Um, prior to that I was in chemical distribution, which is a totally different animal. Um, so water treatment is new to me. Um, and one of the first things I learned pretty quickly was that water in general is regional, if not very local, if you will. Uh, water coming out of Lake Michigan, they tell me, is somewhat uh, a lot better than water that might be coming out of somewhere like Waterloo, Iowa. So it's important to know that and it's important for us to know that in our processes and treatments. Um, also, water out of a well is not necessarily going to be the same as a water out of a city, city municipality. Um, hopefully boot camp today will explain this in detail to you and give you some more benefits um, along with that. Um, this gives you an example, if you will, of some basic water characteristics. Um, this this kind of shows the difference between water surface and groundwater, and this is uh, basically out of Waterloo. So you can see the city of Waterloo has a total hardness of 284 with a conductivity of around 600, whereas a well that might be within the vicinity um, might have a, a total hardness of 1,000 and a conductivity of almost 2,000. So there's a big difference in swing in those applications. And this is the reason that we need to test and apply the right um, chemistries and services for you guys. Why all the fuss? Okay, um, the reason we treat water is fairly obvious to me. Um, there's potential equipment failures. There's unscheduled downtimes that can happen if we're not treating the water accurately. And these photos kind of depict what we're talking about. Um, boilers, obviously you can see iron and corrosion, uh, water cooling, uh, you can see scale, growth, and even algae. And um, this, this, I think, is one of our prospects that we've uh, attempted to get. And I think it's out of the city of Chicago, so you'll be talking to Cheyenne later, and you can ask them about that wild picture right there. Okay, um, why do we take water treatment seriously? Um, some of you probably have an idea as to why we do, some of you might not, but um, I was kind of amazed at the potential catastrophes that can happen um, if you don't maintain the right water treatment. So there are some uh, important uh, reasons why we're here today and why water tech's in business. And we'll play this video real quick uh, to kind of depict what possibly can happen to you. Maybe not to you, but to a company. boiler unit on the railroad tracks there. Right now we're learning more details about exactly what happened. Why don't we head out live to our Ryan Race. She arrived on scene just minutes after all of this went down. Ryan, what have you learned at this point? You guys check this out. You really have to see this for yourself. That giant red tank right there, that's a 60,000 uh, pound boiler unit. It was actually at one time inside the plant there to the right. Now it's laying on the railroad shacks after a giant explosion. Happened around 8 o'clock this morning and it actually shot through the building. You can see a big gaping hole there on the side. Just moments ago I spoke to investigators and now that other boilers have cooled off, they're going in to start looking to see if the building is safe. At this point, all employees have been sent home. Miraculously, nobody got hurt. But some very scary moments this morning, even for people driving by. We talked to one lady who was sitting in the turning lane when a fireball shot in the air. I heard a loud noise, like an explosion. I didn't know if it was an accident coming up behind me or what. And I just saw all the steam and this you know, big piece of equipment here rolling what looked like it was going to come across the road. Fortunately, it stopped right there. Yeah, very fortunate there. Late this morning, we learned of flying debris damaged at least one car driving by. We're going to go talk to that frightened woman in just a few moments. But back here live, there's a lot of work ahead to first figure out the cause and also to make sure that this building is safe to go back inside. We're live in Lakeland this noon. Ryan Ray, ABC Action News. Okay, um, pretty intense, right? Um, for me being new, I thought that was pretty intense. You know, wow, that's a pretty big catastrophe. I was actually in an account, I don't know, about a month ago, a small, small microbrewery, and they had a new, brand new boiler in place. So I was asking them why, you know, what'd you do? What, what happened to the old um, 
boiler? He said, yeah, it blew right through the back of the building. I was like, what? Yeah, it, it just blew right through the back. They mismanaged it and um, they had some serious issues. So very, very important that you guys know why and what you're doing and very important for us to kind of know your systems and what kind of chemistries we need to maintain these boilers and cooling towers, so on and so forth. Um, I just wrote down a couple notes. Regular testing and the right equipment goes a long way, right? Um, also, in regards to you guys that are here and the, the people that are attending online, your support of what we do at WaterTech is very important and goes a long way as well. And that's why you're here today, to kind of understand what we do when we're in your facility and to assist us on a regular basis. The more testing, the more on hand, the hands on site, um, the more benefit it's gonna to bring to your company and to eliminate any of these potential catastrophes. Um, real quick on just water quality. Um, we don't just go in and um, sample your water and come up with some chemistries. We actually abide by um, certain industry standards and we utilize the ASME as well as the ABMA, the American Boiler Manufacturers Association and uh, Cooling Technology Institute. Everything WaterTech does utilizes these resources and industry standards. Um, with that, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm gonna be in my office and I'm gonna hand this over to Jeff Bordendorfer, who's gonna talk a little bit about pretreatment and filtration options. Thank you very much, Jerry. Welcome everyone. Uh, and again, I'll say it uh, now since I'm actually on the camera and people remotely can see me, I'm Jeff Bodendorfer, been with WaterTech for eight years now in the Milwaukee uh, area. <clears throat> so before I jump into pretreatment and filtrations, uh, we'll talk about safety for a second since Jerry's talking about uh, the obvious hazards that exist with our job. So question for people in the audience is, what makes a boiler go boom like that and go through a wall? Does anyone actually know what is going to cause that happening? Okay, so we have running out of water. We had pressure. Could it be the gas isn't firing right on the system? Those are some of the answers. So you were correct about running out of water. So what's going to happen is, which is why you should te test your low water cutoffs every day in your boilers to make sure they work, is if a boiler runs low on water and it doesn't know it, hot and hot and hot and hot. And what typically ends up happening is then someone walks in the boiler room and finds their boiler glowing orange and they think the, the best thing you can do is get water back in that boiler, right? That would make, seem like logical sense. But when you do that, water expands at a rate of 10,000 times when it goes from water to steam. And so when you take that water and you put it on a glowing hot uh, metal surface like your boiler, that's when it really goes boom, right? So always remember, if you walk in your boiler room and it's glowing, shut it down and leave, right? And make sure you would probably evacuate your facility. So. Um, I always, uh, I tell the story, I, I, I fired one customer in my life and I hope I never do it again. And the reason why was because every time I stood in their boiler room, that's all I could think was gonna happen. Every time I was there. And so I was not comfortable being there because they didn't take it seriously. Um, and so it just didn't work out that we could be partners anymore. Um, so what is one of the most important things to actually having good water treatment, right? So we're, we sell chemicals. I like to sell chemicals. I like to sell you more chemicals. Um, but I'd lie if I said chemicals can do everything in a system, right? We don't have a silver bullet. We don't have a everlasting gobstopper of water treatment chemistries. Um, Pre-treatment and potentially filtration are very important parts of that whole water treatment um, portion or package that you want to look at. So we're going to talk about that in the next couple slides. So why pre-treat, right? So Jerry showed you that slide of if you're getting city water potentially versus you're getting your own well water and just the discrepancy that exists between those, right? And if we looked back, I'm sure we could look and see that the iron content was a lot higher coming out of the wall. Silica might be a lot higher coming out um, and some other factors that maybe will impact your process. So a big reason is we want that consistency of the water quality um, because they can vary. You'll find uh, when I go down to McGuanago, um, which is where I'm from, uh, they rotate wells. So one day we might have water quality that is different than the next day because they're rotating between their deep and shallow wells based upon whatever metrics the city is trying to hit, right? So 
not having anything in the plant would send our program uh, for kind of a doozy when they decide to switch those wells. And they don't inform you that they switch wells, they just do what they want to do, right? So having free treatment in your facility is gonna help to try to eliminate that when it gets into your steam boiler or your cooling tower system. And like I said, chemicals can only do so much. Uh, chemical that could do everything, I probably would be retired by now. So um, I keep praying for that day to happen, I just don't think it will. Um, we need pretreatment for almost all applications. Unless you're running Lake Michigan water uh, in your cooling tower, that's really good quality because it's on the surface. Um, you might not need to have any type of pretreatment to do that. And then again, we're trying to prevent scaling, deposition, and uh, we're trying to improve our efficiencies, not decrease those efficiencies, right? That's the main goal behind a water treatment program. So your most common uh, treatment methods, right? Uh, some type of filtration, you know, whether it's uh, cartridge uh, filters, bag filters, um, could be automatic backwashing filters depending on the application, right? Uh, how many of you guys have uh, softeners in your facility? I'm sure that almost everyone, right, is going to have a water softener for some related process. Um, and then uh, you might have reverse osmosis as well. And I'm sure there's quite a few of you in here who also um, have seen those in their facility as well. Okay, a little bit about bag and cartridge filters. The advantages and disadvantages, right, of using a bag or a cartridge style filter like you see here. Um, typically see those on closed loops more than uh, um, open recirculating cooling towers. Um, not really on the boiler side of things do you typically see any type of bag or cartridge filters. Um, so what are the advantages, right? So it's pretty cheap to get going on them. Filter housing is not that expensive. Uh, and the, the filters themselves, the first time you aren't that expensive, right? And they're, they're simple. So you put them in when the pressure gauge reads high enough, you pull them out and you put in a new set. Um, disadvantage is you forever are going through filters. So in the long run, right, obviously there's that, that cost of using filters, you know, for years and years and years. And then again, it requires someone to actually always do the changing. Um, so it is labor intensive and in that um, one of you is going to be doing that. Uh, you might find on cooling towers, um, bigger filtration systems, right? So whether it's a sand type filter or a pep type filter, or again, an automatic backwashing type filter, um, you typically won't see the, the cartridge or the bag filters. Cooling towers are really good at sucking dirt and debris in out of the air. You know, they're not designed to do that, but they're awesome air scrubbers. Um, and so you would be changing those out a lot more frequently if you went with a bag or a cartridge type filter. Um, then if you went with a, a larger vessel that can handle a lot more flow through it before it needs to be backwashed or cleaned. So what are some advantages of those media filters that I was talking about? Um, they can do pretty fine filtration. So 15, you know, you can get down to 15 microns in a cooling tower. That's really, really fine. I mean, typically if you're anywhere in the 50 to 100 range on your micron size, that normally is adequate for cooling towers. Um, most of them are automatic, right? So they're always running with water going through them until it comes time for you to backwash them. So there's not necessarily a lot of labor involved. Um, and again, large surface area. So you can, you can flow a lot of water through that, uh, that system there before it ends up getting um, dirty and needed to be regenerated. Downside is a pretty expensive um, from the get-go. So it's probably gonna be a, a pretty significant capital cost. Uh, especially if you're wanting to try to get like a full flow system, right? So if your cooling tower is running at 1,000 GPM, that's a, that's a pretty big um, filtration system you're gonna need to be able to get full, full flow through that. Um, the other downside is you use a lot of water to backwash those. Um, so if you're looking at ways to save water, these aren't necessarily the greatest um, because they take a lot of water. When you backwash, you're coming from the bottom and lifting it up and flushing things out. So um, they do go through quite a bit of water. Um, and then they are awesome at uh, being bacterial breeding grounds. So um, dirt and debris gets trapped in there, obviously. Bacteria like to settle out on dirt and debris. Um, it, you know, the, the temperature is right in there, the conditions are right. Um, it may not be seeing biocide flow through on a consistent basis. Um, and so they can potentially become great um, bacterial breeding grounds. So not my first choice if you came to me and asked me what kind of filtration would you want on your cooling tower. I wouldn't choose uh, this, and I wouldn't choose bag or cartridge filters either. My choice would be something uh, like a Tech Clean um, automatic backwashing filter, right? So you install it, 
they automatically run, they're gonna use pressure sensors when they've hit their pressure, they're gonna go ahead and automatically backwash themselves, they use significantly less water to backwash them, um, they're relatively easy to install, and then once they're in, you pretty much aren't doing anything with them. So um, TechClean is one brand, um, there's other brands that exist out of there. Um, we'll watch a short video on just kind of how it works um, so you guys get an idea of what's going on. Tech lean, filters will save Tech lean filters will save you time and money every day on the labor and materials that would otherwise be spent on cleaning and replacing filters, screens, bags, cartridges, and spray nozzles. Here's how it works. Dirty water enters the inlet of the filter and passes through the coarse screen. This screen protects the fine screen from being damaged by any large particulates. Then the water moves down the center of the filter body. Water passes through the fine screen and clean water exits through the outlet of the filter, leaving dirt particulates trapped on the inside of the screen. The trapped dirt particulates accumulated on the inside of the fine screen causes a dirt cake effect. This buildup of particulates on the screen mesh causes a pressure drop at the outlet of the filter that is monitored by a DP sensor. When a 5 to 7 pound differential is reached, the electronic controller energizes the flush valve for a backwash cycle. The combined linear movement of the dirt collector and axial rotation caused by the hydraulic motor allows the dirt collector to scan the entire surface area of the screen. Okay, so pretty slick, right? It's just gonna do what it needs to do. Uh, it'll backwash on its own, whether it's once a day or 10 times a day, um, and it's gonna keep you guys uh, not spending time on it. So um, it, well, regardless of the type of filter you're using, there's always gonna be at some point where it's dirty, right? How do we tell that? We use pressure differentials, right? So you typically have a gauge before and after on the inlet and outlet of a system. Um, and you're using that as your marker of when you go, need to go ahead and change out those filters or do a backwash on it. Or again, if it's an automatic system, it's going to do that for you. Um, ideal pressure loss is typically between 10 and 12 pounds over what your nominal is, right? So there's obviously always some pressure loss flowing through that um, system, even when it's clean. And so typically, uh, again, once we get to above 10 to 12 above whatever that is, we typically say the filters are dirty and need to look at being changed. So example would be, you know, three is your nominal pressure drop uh, upon putting in a new set of filters. And then you, by the time you get uh, 10 extra pounds, you're up at that 13, that's probably a good time that you wanna look at changing those. The micron size of your filters is gonna determine how quickly that happens. So again, if you have a 500 micron filter, you know, we always say you're catching boulders in your system versus if you have a one micron filter and you're catching every, you know, all the small little tiny particulate that you can barely even see with your eye um, is going to determine. So in a really dirty system, I wouldn't start out with a one micron filter because you're going to be changing them all the time. Um, I probably want to start with a 500 micron filter either, but that's where you work with your water treatment partner on what is the right um, size for you and then what maybe what's that progression plan of looking to step down. So um, I always like to try to work it down. So as we start to get a longer run life, maybe out of a 50 micron filter, maybe it's time to jump down to a 25 micron filter. And then once we say, okay, you know, we've hit our, we're getting a month out of these filters, right? And I want to see that we continue to progress. Then maybe you jump down to a 10 and then maybe you get down to a one, a one micron filter at some point, or maybe your system never uh, is right for that either. So. So again, just a video of this system's nice in that not only do they have the pressure gauges, but they had that little flow indicator, right? So um, those are inexpensive and, and easy to throw into a line, and they're also a good representation of, you know, is my flow starting to slow down um, in this system or not? So um, I do like those as well. So key takeaways, right? Make sure you don't exceed your maximum pressure drop. You don't want your filter, uh, especially if you have like a, a bag filter, you know, it can rip. Um, if, if that pressure gets so high, um, it's going to give way because that water is going to make its way through, right? So again, it's, it's important to stay on top of that. Um, same with if you have a media filter, you want to make sure that, again, your pressure differentials are making sense. So if it's, if it's set up to 
backwash on a 10 pound pressure drop, but you see it's at a 20 pound pressure drop, right? Make sure that those uh, pressure switches are actually working the way that they should. They do go bad. Um, BDF filters, again, they may need to be disinfected on an annual or semi-annual basis to remove any type of microbiological fouling. Again, depends on your system, what's gonna um, need to be required. You should ideally use fresh water for backwashing those instead of whatever the process water is or tower water. Um, couple, you know, your main reason being you don't really want to put your treated water, you, know, you put energy into it to heat it or cool it, you put chemistry in it to treat it. Um, you know, there's money tied into that water. Ideally, you don't want to be backwashing your system with that and putting it down the drain. So um, that's another consideration of why um, media filters maybe are a little bit of a pain is you'd have to maybe look at having an additional source of water coming into it. And then again, in a cooling tower system, those automatic screen or disc filters, in my opinion, are the way to go. And we could talk offline about, do you need full flow filters or can you do side stream, whatever. There's different feelings on that um, as what's right. Obviously, if you go full flow, it's, it's just going to make that more expensive for you. So, all right, softeners. What do water softeners do without reading the screen? Someone give me an answer. Just by the name of it, what does a water softener do? Softens water. Man, you were going to, you want a hat? You should get you something. Look at that. I throw softballs, uh, so trying to get you guys something. Which one would you prefer? This one? All right. Now you know what you can win if you answer the question. So, you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, so the main thing softeners are going to do, right, what are they actually removing, right? What are we pulling out when we're softening water? Um, typically, it's going to be calcium, magnesium, and iron, right? So um, really, we're focusing on that calcium, magnesium. Um, iron also gets pulled out due to the um, attraction between the positive iron, I, positive iron ion and the negatively charged resin. Um, so they're, it's going to get pulled, uh, but that actually can cause problems with fouling in your softener. So um, what information do we need to know when sizing softeners? Does anyone know that? What, would, what do you think would be important if you say, hey, I need a water softener for my boiler system, um, and I don't know where to start with sizing, right? So would it, do we think it would be important to know potentially how much water you might go through in a day, right? So what could be the max amount of flow you'd ever see in your plant? Is it 100 gallons? Is it 100,000 gallons, right? That's going to obviously have an impact. Um, what maybe is your peak flow? So maybe for eight hours of your day, your plant is running at 100 GPM, and that's the demand of your system, right? And then for the, for the other eight hours, the next shift, your plant's only running at 20 GPM because it's a much lighter shift. Um, that's important. If we size a softener too big to handle your, your, your worst possible flow, um, you might cause issues on the low side um, because then it's so big that you can't uh, possibly soften that water as well. Or you undersize it and you can't possibly soften that water as well because there's not enough time that the water has going through that resin to actually do the job. So that's important, peak flow and low flow. Uh, and then again, total, total volume a day, right, that you might go through of water. Uh, and then commercial units, they regenerate just like the unit in your house. So if you have a water softener at home, right, they're all, they all work the same way. They might look slightly different, right? You might have one in your house that maybe looks like this, top-mounted valve, or in your plant. This is you know, probably the most common application that you see is, is top-mounted valves. You might have uh, what we call um, a nested valve operation. Um, those are for typically really big water softener systems. Um, and so you, you might have a different design, but again, they're all doing the same operation. So how do we soften water, right? So I did, I mentioned the resin that's inside those softeners. So your softeners are going to come loaded with a anionic resin, right? So a negatively charged resin. Uh, and the reason why it's negatively charged is because calcium, magnesium, that iron, uh, which we don't necessarily want to pull, but it, it's going to get pulled. Those are positively charged. All right, and so the natural attraction is as water comes through, uh, all your different calcium magnesium ions uh, are going to interact with your resin beads, which are the, the little circles uh, here. Um, the resin is going to be loaded with sodium ions. Sodium ions have a plus one charge, 
um, calcium, magnesium, iron, they might have a plus two, a plus three charge. And so they're gonna have, they're stronger, and so they can kick the sodium ions off of that resin and bond to it, and that's how we're pulling it out. So we're putting sodium in the water in exchange for pulling out the calcium, magnesium, uh, and iron in the system. And then your water's gonna go out and be treated. Um, and those sodium ions are going to go out along with that. Uh, at some point, it's going to become exhausted. And so you're gonna have to look at going through regeneration, right? At some point, all these resin beads are gonna have, have absorbed as much calcium and magnesium as what they can possibly <coughs> hold. And you have to do something to regenerate that resin so you can go through that process again, right? And so um, that's where we look at, that's why you have a salt tank, right? And you add salt into a system because you're exchanging those sodium ions. You would backwash it uh, and then do a, a brine refill and you would have sodium ions then kick off all of these calcium magnesium ions and put those to drain um, and then refill back up with those sodium ions. So that process that goes on all day long. How do you know your softener is working? Okay, using salt, that's a good one. Could it, could it potentially be using salt but not actually softening properly? You think that's possible? Or is, nope, as long as it's using salt, I know for sure that it's good and I never have to worry about it again. Okay, no, right? So it could be using salt. Uh, it could be using too much salt, maybe, and that's wasteful. It could be using not enough salt. And so it's, yeah, it's going through salt. You know, I had two bags every single day. Well, maybe you really need four bags a day worth of salt in your system for it to actually properly regenerate your water softeners and get you whatever water quality you're looking for, right? So in a boiler, we're probably we're looking for zero PPM of hardness. We don't want any hardness coming through that water softener um, because at the temperatures and pressures that you run a boiler at, it's gonna come out and cause scale, right? And so we don't want any, um, especially the higher pressure boiler that you run. Uh, in a cooling tower system, you might be okay with 10 parts or 20 parts per million of hardness coming off your water softeners because we don't actually need it to be zero in a cooling tower. The temps aren't high enough that we're, we can handle 50 ppm or 100 ppm in your system and not have any issues with scaling. Um, and so that's where, uh, again, just because it's using salt doesn't necessarily, mean, doesn't necessarily mean it's doing what you want it to do. So key takeaways. Soft water is critical, right, to pretreatment and management of heat exchange systems. Hardness is uh, one of your enemies, it can cause scale. Monitor the salt usage and make sure there is salt in your brine tank, right, so that's always uh, uh, an important thing to check. Clean your brine tank, so salt is dirty. Um, even if it looks clean over time, it's, it's not. So when they say salt is 99.97% pure, it sounds really pure, but uh, over time, that might be enough impurity to cause you issues. And so if you never clean your brine tank, underneath that grid in your tank, you probably have a layer of dirt like this. Or if you've used bad salt, which we've seen in facilities where they have gotten really, really bad salt coming in, um, the amount of dirt that's in that brine tank in a short period of time is pretty astounding. And I don't know if we have, we used to have some glass jars with different quality salts in them, and you can just see the amount of dirt um, depending on what kind of salt you use. So the, not all salt is the same. And then one of the things that you should look at doing um, you know, annually is, is always a good idea, is a brine elution study on your softener. So that's how you validate that it's actually working the way it should, right? So we run a brine elution study, we run it through a backwash uh, and a brine draw cycle. You make sure that it's actually pulling the right amount of salt for the right amount of time, and then that it's actually rinsing all that excess salt off um, and that's how you're gonna know you're using the right amount of salt, you're not using too little, you're not using too much, or you're not using too much in too little of a time period. Um, and so that's always a good thing to look at doing and that's something that your water treatment partner should be able to help you with. Uh, dealkalizers and demineralizers. So does anyone have either of these in your guys' facility? Okay, and not at least here, maybe online, someone does. Um, not as common, just depends, right? I think dealkalizers used to be a lot more common, um, but I think RO systems have kind of taken over as being the standard um, of, of what you'll see in a facility. So again, the name kind of implies what it does. So it pulls alkalinity out if it's a dealkalizer, uh, and a demineralizer is to pull out both anions and cations, right? So kind of any ion in the, in the uh, water, and again, 
your process would have to dictate you need water that pure to probably put it in a system like this. ROs, these are reverse osmosis, right? Um, this is, again, more common nowadays with what you guys are probably more familiar with. So uh, they're inside these vessels here, there's membranes. We push the water through the membrane. It's semi-permeable. Water can pass through it. Solids can't, right? And so they, you know, they're, they're good in removing 97, 98, 99% of everything from the water. So you get pretty pure water coming out of these, um, which, again, can be good for your system. Uh, maybe not always the right uh, application though for everything. So why don't we put an RO on a cooling tower, Jeff, right? People have asked that question. Well, the more pure water is, the more corrosive and aggressive it is. Water wants things in it. It wants to be balanced. So it, the second we pull things out of it, it's going to start looking for things to be put back in it. Um, and so in a cooling tower, um, we don't want that level of, a, of uh, aggression or corrosion potential in the system. We would be adding a lot more stuff back in it to try to make it not so corrosive. Um, plus, typically in a cooling tower, you're going through uh, significantly more water, so you'd have to have a, a very, very large RO to handle the type of flows that you might see in your cooling tower if you're going through 30,000 gallons or 50,000 gallons of water a day in your system. Um, compared to a steam system where you're getting a lot of condensate return back. Um, and so you're, you know, if, if you're getting 80 or 90% condensate return back, you don't have to have an RO that can actually handle 100% of your uh, fresh uh, makeup water demand in that day. So again, what are the benefits of using it? And notice how we say here, just a boiler feed water. Um, I would say there's no benefit in using it in your cooling tower. Um, people have tried to blend it before, so I guess, again, oddball situations maybe. Um, you're going to increase your cycles of concentration, right? So if, if in your boiler you're able to run 10 cycles of concentration normally, with an RO you might be able to get 30, 40, 50 cycles as a result of going to an RO. So you'll use less water overall in your system. And then again, better water quality in that uh, it's pulling out total dissolved solids, so it's going to a water softener is not going to change your conductivity. So if your conductivity coming in from the city is 1,000 and it goes through your water softener, it's going to be 1,000 because sodium ions, which we replace calcium magnesium ions with, have about the same conductivity to them. All right, and So you're not going to see any benefit there. A softener is going to pull hardness out. That's the benefit. In an RO, you're going to pull out to the dissolved solids as well as alkalinity. So your incoming water is 1,000. It goes through a softener, which then from there it goes to your RO, and it might go from 1,000 down to 50 or 20 or 10, um, depending on uh, your overall system. So you will be able to reduce the amount of uh, solids in your water, which means you should be able to use that water more or cycle it up before we have to put it down to the drain, right, through blowdown in a system, whether it's a cooling tower or it's a boiler. But again, in a cooling tower, uh, I would not look at RO necessarily. Okay, and here's just a little video on, um, again, kind of how those membranes work, right, what's going on inside of there. Reverse osmosis works by forcing water through a special plastic membrane sheet to remove compounds such as salts, organic compounds, microorganisms, viruses and pharmaceuticals. Rolls of membrane sheets are wound into cylinder-shaped elements. There are several elements inside each long pressure vessel. As water enters the vessel, it flows over the membrane surface as it moves from one end of the vessel to the other. The membrane layer is extremely thin. It allows water to pass through or permeate, while preventing other compounds from passing through. Membranes remove molecules based on their size, shape, and charge. Generally, contaminants larger than water molecules will not pass through, including most chemical contaminants and all microorganisms such as viruses and bacteria. Two streams of water are produced, Pure, clean water or permeate flows across the membrane sheets and passes through the membrane layers to the inside core tube. Water that does not permeate becomes more highly concentrated with salts and other substances. This water is called concentrate. 
The pure permeate water flows out the core tube and one end of the pressure vessel, and the concentrate water flows out another outlet. The concentrate water can then flow into other pressure vessels for the same process to happen again, so even more pure permeate water can be recovered. About 82% of all the source of water becomes purified water. Okay. All right, so how do we take care of our RO, right? So uh, again, that video kind of shows it, it pretty much rejects everything that's larger than a, a water molecule. And so if you're putting really crappy water to your RO, you're probably going to blind off those membranes quicker than you want. Membranes aren't necessarily cheap to replace. Downtime, if you don't have uh, you know, two trains of, of RO to where you can take one down and clean it in place or replace the membranes. Um, and so we got to look at pre-treating the water that's going into your RO, which is pre-treating the water going into your boiler, right? So um, typically you won't see um, just coming straight out of the ground and going right to an RO. You're probably going to go to a water softener first, or you might look at doing chemical treatment. So um, we can feed an anti-scalant um, to your RO system, and that's going to, again, allow um, those membranes to not be blinded off, maybe by hardness that's coming in with it. Um, why would we use chemical treatment, Jeff, versus using softeners before, right? Well, maybe the water, maybe the water coming out, uh, you'd have to have some really, really large water softeners. Maybe your, your flow is high enough that it just isn't, it, it's cheaper to do anti skin than it is to pay for the salt that would go into that system. And so we have customers that are pulling out of their own well um, and they're feeding anti scalant um, instead of doing softeners because of that exact reason, right? The salt cost every year would far outweigh the cost of adding chemical to it. So, but that's something that, again, you work with your water treatment partner on determining what's the best approach for you. Key takeaways. Makeup water quality is critical. So the water that's going to the RO, it's critical that it's good enough or treated properly that it's not going to blind off your RO right away or it doesn't have a lot of chlorine in it that's gonna eat your membranes and destroy them. Um, and so it's not just as simple as, well, if I put in an RO, I know I'm good for sure, right? There is, there is more uh, complexion to it than that. Uh, you need to monitor your concentrate and permeate flows and your pressures. Know if, again, each membrane uh, is working properly in your system. It's gonna reduce alkalinity and conductivity, so that's gonna greatly increase your cycles of concentration of what you can run uh, in a boiler system. The permeate water must be treated to prevent corrosion and biological growth. So uh, again, since we're pulling everything out of that water, it now has become incredibly corrosive. And so there are extra steps taken um, to make sure that we limit that corrosion potential biological side of it too. So if there was chlorine in the water and then it ran through a carbon filter which pulls chlorine out and then it goes into your RO, now you no longer have anything in that water that's going to prevent uh, biological growth from occurring. And then again, you got to look at soft water versus anti-scalant for chloride and water reduction practices, um, especially if you're being put under pressure for chlorides. And more and more cities are getting on people about chlorides, especially if you're in the Madison area. So impact of cycles on water usage. So again, this is just trying to show you that, okay, so over here on the left, if we have, if we're running 1.5 cycles of concentration, you know, we're using 12,000 gallons of water a day approximately. If we were able to run nine cycles of concentration, so we're, we're using that water more, we're concentrating the amount of stuff or minerals in the water. And so the connectivity of that's going to continue to increase and go up and go up and go up. You know, you're only using... 5,000 gallons of water. So you can cut that you know, by more than half by increasing your cycles. Um, you also will re reduce the amount of blowdown um, that you see. Evaporation stays steady. Why do you think that is? Why does blowdown change but not evaporation when we're looking at cycles and water usage? Anyone have an idea? In a cooling tower, if your cooling tower is designed to run, again, that system that runs at 1,000 GPM, right? It's running at 1,000 GPM. So your evaporation rate over your tower is going to be consistent because it's running. Or your boilers, right? If they're running at and producing 50,000 pounds of steam an hour, that's consistent, right? So 
the evaporation rate of making steam or water evaporating out of your cooling tower stays the same, the amount of blowdown we're gonna have to put down the drain is what changes as a result of when we increase that, all right? So when we talk about increasing cycles, it's not to reduce the amount of evaporation, that's a fixed number, you can't change that, right? There's math that states that that's what it is. Um, but what we can change is the amount of water we're putting down the drain. Okay, now I'm gonna just uh, give a handout here. It's just, again, what is your system used for? Um, and so we will, uh, if they didn't move them on me. Okay, I take that back. They moved the sheets somewhere. I don't know where they went. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that later, maybe over lunch. Just gonna have you write down what kind of systems you have, what are they actually used for, make you think about it, right, if you've never actually thought about it. Um, with that, that ends my section, uh, and we're gonna have Kyle up next presenting on cooling towers. So um, any questions about anything pretreatment related before I hand it over to Kyle? How long does the uh, RO filter usually last for? Like depends, um, right, so uh, depends. I would say the rough number that typically is thrown around is probably five to seven years. Um, Again, if, if it sees chlorine, uh, you know, maybe it only lasts six months or a year. Um, if, if it's always really well taken care of, I mean, 